Uh, well, grab your Bibles. I, w- I want you to go and, uh, to, to 1 Timothy chapter 6 if you're not already there. Uh, and before, as you're turning there, I do want to just sort of pause uh, just for a second and recognize um, uh, some of you know Christian Sue. Christian Sue is uh, one of our elders, but also just a, a member of Foothill Church. And this past uh, Thursday, he retired from the Pomona PD after 30 years with one police department. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> It's really, really awesome to listen there. You know, one of the requirements of an elder is that they're well thought of by outsiders, Paul tells Timothy. That's what should be the case. And to hear people that aren't even believers talk about, if I heard the word integrity once, I heard it 20 times. And to hear about his integrity and his, the way that he would walk and live out his faith uh, even there. And so uh, I don't know if Christian is even here this morning, but probably maybe in the next service. But uh, hey, say thank you to Christian just for, just for his service to the community and, and what he meant. And uh, we're just really grateful to God uh, for Christian and Winnie and Abby and their family. All right, so we are, we are uh, a few weeks ago, we started this two-year discipleship journey for the sake of his name. We're saying, man, we want 100% of us to ask ourselves this question, what would it look like for me to live my whole life in obedience to Christ for the sake of his name? And, and what we looked at starting that first week is how comprehensive that question is, right? That there is not one square inch of our lives that we can sort of hold back and say, this part I don't have to live for the sake of his name. This is, you know, it's every part of us. So week one, we looked at all I. I am for the sake of his name. And that led us, of course, then, if I'm going to say that, and that leads us to week two, that, that we, it's all I have, that God, there's nothing that I have that's out of bounds to you, right? You, you own it all. And so, so it's all in, in your hands. And that led us last week, we, we said, well, it, but it takes us beyond that. And then now we start looking out at how God saves, and that's one more for the sake of his name. And today we're going to turn again, and I want to look at this issue of contentment, contentment right? This is a big deal if we're saying we want to live for the sake of His name. Now, I think we all know, like we like the idea of contentment. I mean, and nobody says, I, I want to be discontent, right? We, we think this is a noble, good goal, and yet we struggle, don't we? Contentment is not an easy place to get. Uh, in fact, we'll see this. This is a God thing that he has to do, but there's something uh, that, that to say I want to be content and to actually be content are two very, very different things. It's really, really hard uh, to get to this place because we find ourselves constantly, I want something, I don't have it, and therefore I don't feel contentment, I feel covetous. And so we have these times, especially as Christians, where we go back and forth between these two poles. Maybe there's seasons of contentment and seasons of great discontentment and trying to sort of make our way through this. But as I said, if we're going to do this, if we say, if I say, I want to live for the sake of his name, I want you to see how key this is, that this issue of contentment versus covetousness uh, is, is, is an issue that we really wrestle with and say, man, this has got to be a part of my life. And we're going to do that by looking at 1 Timothy chapter 6 primarily this morning. Okay, now, 1 Timothy is, of course, a letter from Paul to his uh, spiritual son, we might call him. A very close relationship named, of course, Timothy. And, and Timothy is, is Paul's protege. He's, he's a, a guy that, that Paul has sort of kept with him. He's a spiritual son uh, to him, and he's walked with him. And, and he has now left him in a city called Ephesus. Ephesus is this huge city. It's this very prosperous, wealthy city. And so he's going to say to Timothy, hey, in First and Second Timothy, Timothy, I need to teach you how to be a pastor. So we call these, Timothy and Titus, we call them pastoral epistles, okay? The pastoral letters of Paul where essentially he's teaching Timothy and Titus how to be good pastors to their local congregation. And so he says what you might think he would say. He gives them theological advice. Here's things you need to think about. Here's how you need to preach. He gives them very practical advice. At one point he's going to say to Timothy, Timothy, drink a little wine for your stomach, right? Take care of yourself, Timothy. But he's also going to say, he's also going to talk to him about certain groups of people. Hey, Timothy, you need to know there's people in your church that you need to learn how to pastor. Old men and young men, older women and younger women. You need to know how to pastor all these different, you know, masters and slaves. There's all these people in your congregation and you need to be aware of them. But there's another group you need to be aware of and he's going to refer to them in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and that's false teachers. Okay, some false teachers are going to sort of creep in among you and you need to be careful and you need to warn your people against this false teaching. 
Now, he's going to say this, and I want you to see this, that false teachers, and if you were to turn on some of your, you know, religious programming today, you'd find this out, that false teachers very often are motivated, as you'll see here in a minute, by money. They're motivated by getting more and more. Okay, and now so Paul's going to do this. He's going to seize on that opportunity to go, okay, so let's talk about money. So here's what he's going to do. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, he's essentially going to say, he's going he's to talk to Timothy about how to talk to his congregation about money. Okay, follow me? So that's what's happening in 1 Timothy chapter 6. I want to talk to you, Timothy, about how to talk to your people about money. And Timothy, in your congregation, you're going to find there's two groups of people. There are people who want to be rich, and there are people who are rich. And I'm going to teach you how to speak to both of them, okay? And isn't that a great definition of most people in here? We either want to be rich or we're rich, and most of you think, that's neither of me. You wait, okay? All right, so let's go, and, and I want you to start. We'll start here in chapter 6, and actually skip down. If, if, if you're, you're reading your ESV, you'll see chap, uh, verse 2 is actually divided uh, between the previous section, and then it kind of, the, the editors uh, drop down the last part of verse 2 and attach it to verse 3. And that's where I want to pick up right there at that very end of verse 2, verse two where, where Paul says, teach and urge these things. So now, He's just got done doing five chapters of teaching. And so I think he's looking backward on the one hand and saying, okay, teach and urge what I've just taught you. Okay, and he's just finished teaching up some stuff. And now he's going to say, but also teach what I'm about to teach you. Follow me? Now keep going. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, okay, then what? He is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. That's false teachers, okay? If anyone teaches this way or teaches a different doctrine than what's been handed to us by Jesus and the apostles, that's your New Testament, not saying if they just preach the New Testament or don't preach the New Testament. It's saying if their words do not line up with what Jesus taught, okay, they're false teachers. So he's, he's going to tell us how to learn the difference between a false teacher and a good teacher, a right teacher, right? Okay, and so that's part of what he's saying. First of all, do they accord, are they in harmony with the words of Christ handed to the apostles, handed to us in our New Testament scriptures? Okay, so, so we want to be sure that we have this. Now, but there's, we can go further with that because he said just the words of the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's actually, you'll, you might see a footnote there that might say it's, it, it's the word healthy. That's because the Greek word is actually where we borrowed our word hygiene from. That's a Greek word, hygienic so, so he's saying that these words from any teacher should, first of all, should be in accordance, should be in harmony with the New Testament, and they ought to produce health. That's what godliness does. A teaching of godliness will produce, he says, it'll produce a health that accords with godliness. Okay, so there again, one of the things you ought to see in, a, in, in proper biblical teaching is that it ought to cause us to become. It ought to, it ought to encourage us and push us towards being more godly, not less godly. If you hear preaching that, that would deny that you need to repent of sin or you need to turn from unrighteousness in any way, that isn't according to godliness, right? The Bible's gonna call us to repentance. The Bible's gonna call us to changes, and so he's saying, Timothy, be careful. And he said, if people teach like this, this different doctrine, they are basically pompous windbags, right? Don't listen to them. They're idiots. They're fools. That's what he's going to call them. They are puffed up with conceit and they understand nothing. Okay, now look what happens. They have an unhealthy, I want to know else. Okay, what, how else can I find out who uh, uh, false teachers are? They have an unhealthy craving for controversy <laughs> and for quarrels about words and, and, and which produce envy and dissension and slander and evil suspicions and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. 
The Greek word for all of that is Twitter. <laughs> imagining, imagining that godliness with contentment is a means of gain. Now you hear what he says, that what will be produced out of these false teachers is quarrels and envies. Here's what they will do. The fruit of their ministry will produce disunity among the people of God. Little church, listen to me. Be very, very careful of churches or pastors that major on the minors or minor on the majors. You follow me? It is possible for us to be so caught up in some secondary or tertiary doctrine that we ignore the primary thing the Bible is teaching us, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Now, now this is all kinds of ways we can do this, right? There are gonna be people that say, man, all I want to know about is, uh, is, 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 is creation young or old, okay? Well, if you camp on that and that is your ministry and that's your thing, you will produce unhealthy tensions and dissensions among your ministry. If all you want to talk about is the gifts of the Spirit, you major on a secondary point. If all you want to argue about is politics, <laughs> right, then, then what happens? Invariably, it produces all of these things. This is what false teachers do. But notice at the very end, he says they imagine that godliness is a means of gain. Now, here's what I think Paul's saying. Timothy, they're not really concerned with godliness. They're not concerned with becoming more like Jesus. What they're concerned about is the commodification, if you will, the commercialization. They look and go, wow, this Christianity thing, it could be really profitable, like, I could make some money off this deal. And so they look and say, godliness is a means of great gain. Uh, or or, or uh, godliness is a means of gain for them. And I'm thinking he's talking about financial gain there, right? That, that these false teachers aren't interested in that. Now, now, remember, Timothy lives in a wealthy city with wealthy people. People go to Ephesus to make it, right? If you can make it in Ephesus, you can make it anywhere. And, and, and he's trying to preach godliness, and so Paul's going, Timothy, here's what's going to happen. There's going to be people that start to preach to your congregation and tell them, you know what, what God wants you to be is, is wealthy. And God wants you to have more and more and more. And it's a means of gain for you, right? We still have those preachers in the world today, right? That'll tell you that if you just have enough faith and if you just do the right things and if you're godly enough, then man, you will be massively blessed. You'll have all the wealth in the world and all the health that you need and your life will be great. That's false teaching. That's false teaching, okay? So, so he says, so, so, so in essence, he's saying this. If, if I wanna know if somebody's a, a true a teacher of the word of God, I think Paul would say, look, number one, ask yourself, does it line up with the New Testament? Number two, does their teaching unite or does it divide? And then, and then number three, does it promote, and here's where I think he's driving, does it promote contentment or covetousness, okay? Now, so what Paul's done is he's opened up the, the subject of financial gain, okay? And now he's going to begin to drill down on that. So now, now keep reading with me. And in, and in verse, uh, verse 6, he says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, now don't be confused. He's not saying that means wealth. I think what he's saying is, Timothy, here's the irony in all this. Right? The false teachers are going to say, you get, you get financial wealth. Paul's going to say, no, no, no. No, Timothy, there are riches that come from godliness if what you mean is spiritual riches. And if you will combine that with contentment, Timothy, you put those things together and that is massive gain. You walk in obedience to Christ and it pays high spiritual dividends. You walk for the sake of his name and you're gonna see God do some things in your life if you're content. Now just dream with me for a minute. Imagine that you were utterly content. You were content in 
your career and you were content with your possessions and you were content with your marriage and you were content with your home, how in the world does anyone get there? Uh, you can turn over if you want me. It's probably with me. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's back in Philippians chapter 4. And some of you know this passage. Here's what Paul's going to do. Paul, Paul is writing to the Philippians. And, and essentially, the whole purpose of his letter is to write to them and say, man, you guys make me really happy. And you make me so happy because you have been such an encouragement and support to me. And I want to be an encouragement to you. In fact, They've taken up an offering for Paul, and they've given Paul so Paul can go and continue his ministry. And so he actually is going to mention that in chapter 4. Look, look what you did for me. You were so kind to me. And he says in verse 10, I rejoice greatly uh, at, at that now at length you've revived your concern for me. He's talking about their giving. You indeed were concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now look what he says in verse 11. Not that I'm speaking of being in need. I don't bring this up because I want more of your money. He says, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. So just stop with me here for a second. Contentment is learned. It is not something we just naturally have. It's learned, but I want you to see how it's learned. Okay, look what he says. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. What? How, Paul? How in the world did you get to a place where you could be hungry or you could be full and you could say, man, I am perfectly content. I have learned the secret to be content no matter what my life is doing. And that's where we get verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? This is not a tattoo for Olympians, <laughs> right? This is not about you can do whatever you set your mind to. This is, you know where you need the greatest strength in the world? You know what's more powerful than any Olympic training? You know what Olympic athletes and, and elite athletes in the world can almost never get to? Contentment. Contentment. They work and work and work and work and work and work to get more and more and more and more. They've not learned the secret of being content. They are utterly discontented with their life many times. And Paul says, here's, here's the key. You know what it is? It's Christ. It is that Christ is enough. Christ is a sufficient, right? That's what he's doing. So Paul says, look, Godliness with contentment, man, that's great gain. Again, just, just think of this with me here. What a place to live. What a place for your heart to be. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being unfazed by the success of someone else's life? unfazed by the car they drive, the neighborhood they live in, the vacations they get to take, their perfect Instagram life, and just saying, I am so happy with where I am. I am so grateful to God for what he's given me. I don't need any of that. Tell me that is not an, an amazing place to find your heart, rather than this constant like, man, Oh, I got to have what they have. How come I can't live in this neighborhood? How come I can't have that house? How come I can't drive that car? How come I can't eat their food? How come I can't go on that vacation? How come I can't have all the more? You ever met somebody like this who just seems perfectly satisfied with what God has given them in life? That is a remarkable human being. Now, 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 now hear me. I think sometimes we hear that and you think, that's somebody who's just sort of given up. Like, I don't care about advancing in life. No, it's not. It's somebody who says, my motivation is not to just have more. My motivation is like, look how good God has been to me. And I'm just going to keep going down this path. And maybe God will be even more. I don't know what he's going to do, but I'm so happy where I am right now. Don't you want to live right there? Yes. Don't you want to live right there where you can go, I have found the secret of being content. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Foothill, we will never, you and I, I will never live for the sake of his name if covetousness 
has a grip on my heart and contentment is nowhere to be found. I won't because I will be chasing other things. I'll be constantly, there'll be something that has higher priority in my life. Now, watch what Paul does because Paul's gonna now go, Timothy, let me tell you why that's true. Let me tell you why, verse six, godliness with contentment is great gain. Okay, look at verse seven. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. Okay, now, just, just pause for a second. Think about what Paul just said. Paul's essentially saying, Timothy, if we have food and clothing, I, I think what he means by that, by the way, I don't think he just says, you know, you can live on the street, but if you have food and clothing. I think the idea there is that that captures if we have our basic necessities taken care of, that's enough, right, Timothy? Because I can't take anything with me, right? You've heard the old adage, you've never seen a U-Haul being, you know, behind a hearse, right? When Elon Musk dies, what will he leave behind? Everything everything. He will take nothing with him. He will leave it all. We will all leave it all. So Paul's saying, look, we don't need any of that stuff for the life to come. If we have food, clothing, shelter, we have our basic necessities taken care of. Timothy, we're okay right now. Now, Paul never says, Jesus never says, you should be okay living in abject poverty. You understand the difference, right? That is not what's being described here. He's saying, I'm provided for. I, I, I can be content if my basic needs are there. And if you think that Paul is lying or Scripture is lying or that I'm lying about this, go on a missions trip sometime to a third world country. And you will run into children and adults who have a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of what you have and are smiling and laughing and playing in the streets, right? If we have food and clothing. Now, here's what you're gonna discover. Very few of God's children only have food, clothing, and shelter. Very few, okay? So Paul says, it's all we've got, right? So, so, so then, then, then we're, we're taken care of, right? See, you have, 99.9% .9 of you in this room have far more than that right there. You do. God has been that gracious to you. So do not hear Paul arguing for what's called asceticism. You remember heard this word? These like ascetic monks that like, I'm going to deny the material world. I'm just going to live in abject poverty and people are just going to have to give me food. Paul is not arguing for that at all. What he's arguing for is contentment in place of materialism and in place of covetousness. That's his point. Timothy, if you got that, then you don't really need anything, right? Now, keep going. And in verse 9, he's going to start talking. Okay, Timothy, there's a group in your people, a group of people in your church. Look what he says, verse 9. But those who desire to be rich, that's a category of people. I told you there's those who desire to be rich and those who are rich. He says, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Here are people, Timothy, there are people in your church whose primary motivation, what they want more than anything, is to be rich. And they've convinced themselves of all kinds of things. Why? Oh, I want to I wanna be, I want to do this and I want to do this. But, but, but their, their primary heart motivation is I just want more wealth. And Paul's going to say to him, Timothy, you warn those people. You warn them because, listen, that's a trap. That's a snare. The devil has laid something in front of their feet and he will ambush them and they will find themselves on a treadmill. They will find themselves on a stationary bike pedaling like mad, trying to finally find the end of the road and they'll never get there. It is a trap, Timothy. You've got to warn them of this. But I want you to notice this. And he says, part of the trap is this, is that, is that, this kind of desire to be rich doesn't stop with money. It will start to leak out into all kinds of, look at, here's the, here's the deal. Money is simply a drug and covetousness is an addiction. 
What will people do? What do addicts do to feed their addiction? Anything. Anything. I will compromise, I'll do whatever it takes to feed this addiction. So look what he says. He says, you know what will happen to these people? It, it will bring them to a place where they go into many senseless and, and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction, right? That's the end of this. It will plunge them into ruin. And then we get the most famous passage that you might have heard on money in verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And then he goes on. It's through this craving that some have wandered from the, away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pangs. I want you to notice something. Some of you have heard it or it's been repeated a million times. Uh, money is the root of all evil. No, no, no. It's not money is the problem. It's the love of money. It, it's not... The root, it's a root. It's not all evil, it's all kinds of evils. That's literally what it says. Okay, because, and, and we know this to be true, right? Think about what the love of money does to people. How many families have been torn apart over a love of money and possessions. Mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, leave them some money or I leave this child this and that child that and pretty soon the children that you leave behind start arguing and now 20 years later they hate each other and they haven't talked to each other over a love of money. Partners who went into partnership together and they were great friends and man, isn't it be fun? And now, and now uh, several years later money got in the way and now their friendship is split. How many people have lost their integrity over a love of money? How many crimes have been committed over a love of money? How many political backroom deals have been made that are illicit because of a love of money? How many people, Malachi 3, have robbed God because you love money? I mean, we could go on and on. It is the root of all kinds of evil. And Paul names them, they wander from the faith. See that? I mean, there were people that go, man, I remember back when I was a young college student and I had nothing and then I got married and we had even less than nothing and we prayed like crazy and we felt utterly dependent upon God. Oh God, please and help us and come through. And then God was so gracious and he gave you this job and he filled your life with a career and you began to make a lot of money and pretty soon you realize, man, this is where it's at and I don't really need God anymore. Fine, he's a religious hobby for me, but I don't really need him. And then you discover 20, 30 years later, I've wandered. I'm away from God. And my life has been pierced with many pangs. I have regret. I get to the end of my life. How did this happen to me? I wasn't a good dad or mom because I love money more than I love my kids. You've heard this said, right? Nobody on their deathbed goes, I wish I spent more time at the office. Nobody. I get to the end of this, right? And I'm, I, I find myself now because I love money, I, I worry about my stuff all the time. I cannot give my, my car to a valet guy. I mean, he could scratch that precious thing. I, I, I find myself having a seared conscience. I'm numb to the things of God because something else has won my heart. I find myself depressed because I chased the pot at the end of the rainbow and when I found it, I realized it didn't satisfy me. What have I been working my whole life for? Timothy, warn those who desire to be rich. Hear me, Foothill. Every time the word of God is preached, you have a decision to make. Is it telling you the truth? Or do you know the truth? Will you believe it? Seriously. Like it just really comes down to, do I actually believe that Paul and Jesus and the New Testament and the Old Testament and my Bible is telling me the truth or will I just say, nope, I can do this on my own? I understand that if you're not a believer. But if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you should hear this and say, yes, yes. Talk to those who want 
to be rich. That's category one. Now, I'm going to skip over this middle section, verses 11 six through 16. And let me just tell you what's happening there. I think here's what's happening. I think Paul is saying, Timothy, don't be like that. Timothy, do not chase that. Don't be caught up in that covetousness. Don't desire to be rich, Timothy. And then he's going to go and he's going to break into this doxology about Jesus Christ. And here's why I think why. Timothy, there's so much, something so much greater than you chasing fool's gold and confederate currency. There's Christ, and he's enough, Timothy. You don't need that, okay? That's the, that's the first thing. Now, go to verse 17. And now he's going to talk to the rich, okay? See this? Verse 17, he says, as for the rich in this present age, okay? So let's stop there. Look at me for a second. As for the rich. Now, most of you go, not me, not me. Right? Rich people are Elon Musk and Bill Gates, right? It's all those, the, the usual suspects, right? They're the, they're the rich people. Well, of course. I think they also probably fall in a biblical category of like kings and those in high places with influence and all kinds of power and things. Okay? Some of you think, no, I'm not rich. See the car I drive? That guy out there that drove that car up, I hope he's here. You talking to him, Chris? Right? That's who we're talking to. Um, I need to tell my friend who lives in that neighborhood to listen to this sermon, right? Very few of us think we're rich. You're rich. Do you realize, I was just talking to our local economist before the sermon, <laughs> do you realize the median household income I think it's in, in America, it's like $130,000. In California, some, some, somewhere on like, nine, just Southern California, like $95,000. We are in a bracket. Do you understand? We are in a bracket that is not just the top one percenters. We're in some fraction of one percent in terms of what we have. You know what it means to be rich? It just simply means this, you have more than you need. You have more than what Paul just talked about. And by the way, notice this, Paul isn't going to say, being rich is evil. He just says, just talk to people who have much more than they need, Timothy. Do you understand that? It's hard to be rich. Like, we got problems, don't we? Remember, remember Jeff Foxworthy used to say, you know you're a redneck if, you know? You know you're a rich person? If you cook a meal at night and you pack up the leftovers and you open the refrigerator and go, oh, there's no room. <laughs> I got no room for all these leftovers. You know you're a rich person if your clothes have seasons, <laughs> right? Do you know this, right? You're, you have pants that have seasons, shoes that have, you have sheets that have seasons. You pack those away to make room in your closet because you don't have room for the stuff you're around. You know you're rich if you go to a restaurant, first of all, just being there. Second of all, and you look and say, say man, this, this menu just has too much. You know you're rich if you can control the weather in your own home. And you know what happens? In a few weeks, rich people are going to give other rich people gifts that those rich people don't even need. Now, I think you're going to be surprised at how God talks about this. Okay, that's, can we all just settle the fact that 99% of us in this room are rich, are unbelievably rich. So what is the word to rich people? Paul's going to have a few things to say to us, okay? He's going to say this. Number one, tell the rich not to be Haughty. You see this in verse 17? Tell them not to be haughty. Now, what is haughty? That's just arrogance, right? In other words, you know what happens? Wealth has a way of producing pride. Tell me this isn't true. How humble we were when we had nothing. And then we start to gain wealth. And some of you fabulous wealth. And you know what you begin to think about yourself? I'm wealthy because I'm smarter. I must be really intelligent. I must be incredibly savvy. And I am better and I'm smarter than that other person. I used to be a lawyer. Some of you know this. And back, back I, I will never forget this. 
So, so I, was a, I was like what they would call a transactional attorney. So I basically help people make deals or help people break deals, right? So that's kind of what a transactional person does. The worst clients in the world, okay? No offense to anybody in here, okay? The worst clients were doctors. You know why? Because they're really smart. And they have a ton of money. And they think that being really smart in an area of science and having a ton of money just makes them incredibly smart in everything. And when I say worst, I don't mean they were hard to work with. I mean they made the worst decisions you can possibly imagine. <laughs> and then came to me and said, can you unwind this all for me, right? <laughs> like, like there's a self-importance that comes from that. I'm somehow, listen to me, hear me, business savvy does not equal biblical wisdom. It does not equal biblical wisdom. Tell them, Timothy, don't be haughty, be humble. Second of all, he says, tell them not to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches. You see that? In other words, in other words, Timothy, tell them not to put their hope in this false gold and this confederate currency, right? Tell them not to go there. There are economic fluctuations. There are things that take away wealth that we, are, that we have no control over. And Timothy, this is such a ridiculous place for people to put their hope. We used to say, I, I practice real estate, and I, I, we used to say that whether somebody is poor or rich depends on when they die. Because of what's happening in the market in that moment? Some of you are in the mortgage industry or the real estate industry, man. Ten years ago, boom, 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 boom. And now it's like it's all dried up. Hey, look, it's coming back. It will. It just will. But don't put your hope there. Proverbs 23, do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to, discerning enough to desist. When your eyes light on it, it's gone. For suddenly it sprouts wings, flying like an eagle toward heaven. Oh, I have such a burden for young people in this room. You're hearing this at an age where it can actually matter. It can actually matter for you. If you'll listen to it. That is the worst possible goal for you to have in life. If God gives you riches, it is a gift. It's not a goal. It's not a goal. Don't set your hope there. But then look at where he goes in verse 17. Don't set your hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. Now look what he says about God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Not stingily. What God wants for you is you to just eat beans and rice and you to have nothing. He is so incredibly kind to you. That's why I say when Paul says to Timothy that if we have food and clothing, right? If I have a pair of jeans and a Snickers bar, you're good. Yeah. I think he's saying, yes, that's true. But Timothy, you have so much more than that. Foothill Church, you have so much more than that. And God richly provides you with everything for your enjoyment. God loves it when his children enjoy the good things that he's given to them. Do you realize this? God made an entire animal out of steak and another one out of bacon. <laughs> and you can put those things together and have a bacon wrap filet. And it's glorious. <laughs> And it's a gift of God. He's given marriages intimacy. That was his idea. He put trout in streams, and I get to go fly fishing. And he put snow on mountains, and some of you can go snowboarding, and he wants there to be this big giggle of a smile on your face as you race down that hill. He loves you to enjoy good things. And he is richly generous with that. See, I think we think that if I'm satisfied, God will never do these things for me. Somehow I have to live in poverty. But he's saying, man, I just want you to love this gift. And I want that. I want your worship not to terminate on that gift. I want you to follow that line back to the sun, to the one that it comes from, and say, God, how amazing are you? How amazing are you when you go to lunch today and you stop and you say your little perfunctory prayer? Can you just remember that what you're about to put in your mouth is a gift of God? 
He could have put a tube in your arm to feed you. Right? There's a lot of ways God could have sustained us. And you know what he's going to do? You're going to go eat guacamole. What? How kind. There's a billion things we can eat. And God, you're so creative and you're so good to us to do all this. Put your hope on God, he says. Now, now, watch, he keeps going in verse 18. And he says, now, rich people, here's what you don't do. Here's what you do. You are to do good. Rich people, there's a reason God gave you extra. There's a reason God gave you more than you need. There's a reason God has set this before you. He has made you rich for a reason. Why? So that you could do good, Paul says in verse 18. In fact, he says you could be rich in good works. Isn't that interesting? Command the rich people to be rich in good works. Command them this, right? Use your wealth to bless. Use your wealth to invest in the kingdom, as you'll see here in a moment. Then he goes on. He says, not just to be rich in good works, but to be ready to share. Ready, okay? Like this is locked and loaded. I walk around my life, and I am ready to be generous, I am ready to do what God wants me to do. Foothill, the last thing in the world I want to come out of this foot for the sake of his name series is you hear a few sermons about your money and go, oh yeah, oh well, I guess I'll give. I could care less about that. I pray that you and I both will go, what I want to do is live a generous lifestyle, ready to share, ready to share with those in need ready to share with missionaries and church planters and Foothill Pregnancy Resource Center and single moms who are struggling, ready to share with youth, ready to share with children, ready to make that sort of stuff happen. And then look what happens, he says in verse 19. Thus, what happens when you do that? Storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Now, there's a ton in there, but look at that last phrase, so that they may take hold, because this is an indication. It's not I can buy my way into heaven. It's that this is an indication of where your heart even is. And he says, Timothy, when they do that, when rich people, when those who have more than they need actually give and share with those in need, they are storing up treasure for themselves. Now, wait a second, Chris. Last week, a couple weeks ago, we talked about we're not supposed to lay up treasure for ourselves, but be rich toward God. You're right. But Jesus is going to say it this way in another place. Don't lay up treasures for yourselves on earth where moth and rust corrupt and thieves break through and steal, but lay up yourself treasure in heaven. See, here's the, here's the amazing thing. If I decide that the, the, the chief thing of my life is I'm going to store up more and more and more and more stuff in this life, I lose it all. If, rather, I decide I'm going to send it ahead Invest in kingdom causes. Well, well, what the Bible's going to say, what Paul's saying here, what Jesus is going to say, is I'm storing it up in heaven. I will never lose that. There's a spiritual currency. There is, a, there is an eternal 401k, whatever you want to call that, right, that gets stored up, and it shows where my heart is in all of this. So, so, so look at, let me, let me just end with this. Uh, John Stott uh, kind of gives this summary. He says, okay, if I look back on, on, on first, uh, first Timothy chapter 6, he says this, against accumulation of material goods, Paul sets simplicity of lifestyle. Against rejection of the material world, that's asceticism. Paul sets gratitude for God's generosity. Against covetousness for more, Paul sets contentment with what we have. And against selfishness, Paul sets generosity that imitates God. Look at, just, just think of what I just said here, okay? Pa- Paul, Paul gives us, Paul gives us simplicity, gratitude, contentment, generosity. That's a pretty good description of living in obedience to Christ for the sake of His name. If I have these things, if this is the fruit of the gospel, so, so, okay, so what do we do? Let me give you 
let's call it a spiritual, and then something very practical. And I don't like separating these two, but just follow me. Some of us would look at our lives and say, Lord, I am more covetous than I am content. And you would go to Philippians chapter 4 and 1 Timothy 6 and say, God, help me. The secret to contentment is I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jesus, I do not have the strength to be content. Help me. Okay, that, that, that's the, the spiritual thing you can do. Let me give you something really practical to do. Tonight, we're having what we call advanced commitment night. And it's what it sounds like. Next week is Commitment Sunday. Tonight is Advanced Commitment Night. If you're, so if you're advanced, come on tonight. No, this is, this, is, this is for people who go, man, I want to put a nail in the coffin of covetousness. I, 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 I want to I step into what God is doing. I want to be ready to share. And I just want to encourage you, hear me, this is for everybody. I realize not everybody's going to be here, but, but I want you to know it's for everybody. Your kids, everybody can come, right? Um, there is not a football game on tonight that is more important. That's why God created DVRs, right? So, um, so, so look, be here. What are we trying to do? We're trying to raise $7 million. And I, I sent out this video because I want to make sure everybody's clear on this. This is not, hey, $7 million to do something extra. It, 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 this is above our, that is our budget. That's literally $3.5 million per year to do everything we're trying to do, to minister to those single moms and be able to support Foothills Pregnancy Resource Center and send missionaries and plant churches and turn the lights on and disciple you here and disciple your children and your youth and all the things that we're trying to do. That's all that it is. This is isn't so crazy number that we've come up with. And it's simply saying this, what part will you play? If you go, man, Foothill Church is my home. This is where I come and God has spiritually nourished me. Then what part do you sit on the sidelines and do nothing? Or do you say, no, no, man. No, man, I want to be a part of this. Like this is a source of spiritual nourishment for me and my family. This is maybe the primary source of our spiritual nourishment. And we are going to play a part. So I'm asking you, don't stand on the sidelines. Lean in. Go first. Tonight is for people who are saying, I want to go first. I want to go first. I want to go first. I don't want to ask you to do something that I'm not prepared to do myself. Michelle and I have been praying about this, thinking about this. And I'm going to be honest with you guys. The beginning of this, before I preached any of this to you and to myself, I had a very different idea of what I was going to give. And the Lord has changed that. Lean in. Put a nail in the coffin of covetousness. Right? I can be content with what God has given me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let's pray. Father... Thank you. Thank you for your word. And thank you for the ways, that, Lord, it intersects with our lives in really, really challenging places sometimes. Some of us in this room, God, have been so rich towards you. I don't know who they are, but God, you know, this is maybe not a sermon for them, but many, many of us can look and say, God, have not. I have laid up more and more treasure for myself. I got treasure upon treasure upon treasure sitting in a storage container or in a garage or somewhere. And, and God, I want to be rich toward you. And so help us, God. And God, I know that just starts with a place of contentment versus covetousness. Everything, every commercial we watch, every mall we walk through are, are palaces of covetousness. God, help us. Help us, God. We desire to be the people that you want us to be, to live for the sake of your name. And we need your help. We can do all things with Christ who strengthens us, but Jesus, we need you desperately to strengthen us. We love you, we thank you, and we ask this in your name.